morning, everybody. As you guys know, we're wrapping up our series called Take Heart, How to Get Through What You're Going Through. And we felt it was just really important in light of all the stuff that we're all experiencing, we're all seeing, we have friends and family members being affected by all the things happening in our world, in every sector, in every level. And we just thought, you know, as much as we wanted to really focus and do like a Christmas series this month, we thought, no, really what our church needs, what people need is strength and encouragement to take heart and to address relevant things that are happening and where God, where Jesus, where our faith fits into the picture. So that's what we've been doing. We're going to wrap up today uh, and talk about quick recap of where we've been, and then we're just going to talk about speak up, and we'll have a wrap up, okay? So that's where we're at today, how to get through what we're going through. So let's pray once again and just ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you so much for the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the only one who knows the things to come. And Jesus, you said that same Holy Spirit would show us things to come. We'd all have a knowing of what we need to know, the pieces of the future puzzle that we all need to know individually. Thank you, Lord. We thank you that you'll show us what we need to know and when we need to know it. And we can walk out our lives with faith and joy and peace, trusting, as we've already prayed and sang about, that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So God, I pray you speak to us today, connect the dots, encourage us, Help each and every one, both in the room and those watching online. In Jesus' name, and everybody that agreed said? Yeah. Amen. All right, one more time. I want to show you guys this meme because, you know, we're talking about things that we do understand. There's lots of opinions on, lots of views, lots of angles. But our goal is to have the biblical angle. That's our goal. We've said it, you know, many times. We're not pushing Republican or Democrat. We are Christocrats. We are Christ followers, Bible-believing Christians, people, and so in talking about things, we understand there's lots of views. So Oscar Wilde said this, he said, if you want to tell people the truth, make them laugh. Otherwise, they'll kill you. So let's start with some laughter. Here is something amazing, the Holy Bible. Not sure how they pulled that off, but here is a Holy Bible signed copy. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants that Bible? <laughs> Here's one. This is a cartoon. Jesus is speaking, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. The disciples, great. Not only do I have to forgive my brother, now I have to do math. <laughs> forgive, because it's easier than math. Math is hard. And then here's one more for you. Some of y'all played in hide and seek with Jesus. And pretty soon, he's going to say, ready or not, here I come. So who, who believes that Jesus is coming again? It might be during our lifetime. Very well could be, and it may be 100 years from now. But we're always ready in our heart, always prepared in our heart. And saying, just like the Bible says, you know, the book of Revelation, I think the last words in the book of Revelation are Maranatha, or come quickly, Lord Jesus. I don't know about you, I've literally found myself saying those words. Walking around the house or hopping in my car or just, you know, hearing something on the news and I'll be like, come quickly, Lord Jesus. No wonder the early disciples said Maranatha all the time. So Jesus is coming and we want to be obviously prepared. But in the meantime, here's what he told us that we could expect to experience. John 16, 33. This has been our text for this whole series. Jesus said... I have told you these things in the book of John, especially chapter 16. He was telling them a lot about what was going to happen after he was crucified and what he was going to be doing in heaven to prepare a mansion for us, but what was going to be happening on the earth and so on. And he said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. So that is a reality. Not all of us can testify. There's troubles, there's challenges, there's difficulties. There are things we all go through. It's a fallen world. In this world, we will have trouble. Or tribulation is, in other words, stress, pressure. But take heart, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. So for the believer, the outlook is different. You know, in the Old Testament, it says, 
um, about the glory of the Lord. You know, rise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has arisen upon you. But deep darkness covers the people. But the glory of the Lord arises on you. So you just always have to have in your heart a knowing that even though there will be at times and then ultimately deep darkness in the world in which we live, it is a troubled world, but the glory of the Lord arises upon you as believers. So when Jesus says, in me you'll have peace, take heart, I've overcome the world, it's not just a platitude. It's because he will arise upon us, within us, out from us, with his glory, his strength, his peace, his help. So we want to have that as our baseline for all the things we'll look at and have been looking at. So how to get through what you're going through. So once again, let's hopscotch through some headlines. What are we going through? What is happening in the world around about us? These are headlines. Most of these are headlines from this past week. Every week, it's a litany. So here's a few. Let's look at them. New Zealand pastors join forces to fight COVID mandate, limiting attendance unless vaccinated. They've had some really big lockdowns in New Zealand and in Australia. Twitter. Twitter slaps unsafe label on the American Heart Association's mRNA vaccine warning. They put up some stuff, apparently, and Twitter put a warning sign on the American Heart Association. The Pope, a New York Post reported, Pope Francis says extramarital sex sins aren't that serious. Wow. The One World Religion. Opening in 2022, Chrislam, the Pope, along with some of the leaders of the Muslim uh, faith, have been getting together among other faith leaders to perpetuate, to push for a one world religion. Now, that shouldn't be a big surprise. The Bible said that was going to be the case. The big surprise, though, is when you see the headlines opening in 2022. It is under construction even now. You can look it up. You can, don't Google. Remember I told you don't Google. <laughs> you can duck, duck, go all of this, okay? Check it out. Here's some more. Matthew Barnett, he is the founder of the Dream Center in L.A. They do so much work to help drug addicts, prostitutes, homeless. I mean, there's so many things they do right in L.A., downtown L.A. But he said, landing soon in Los Angeles from Alabama. He'd been out traveling. I've traveled 20 states since the pandemic, and most Californians really don't understand how normal other states are living their lives like traveling to different planets. Also, how many churches are growing with Californians who've left? So we've traveled a little bit during this whole COVID thing. Many of you guys have as well. It is night and day in certain states and in certain cities. Absolute night and day in terms of freedoms, in terms of mindset. Pennsylvania High Court throws out mask mandate for schools. That just happened last week. <laughs> woo woo! Florida School Boards Association cuts ties with the National School Board Association following a letter targeting parents as domestic terrorists. Parents stood up at a school board meeting to ask some questions about some things, and they got targeted as domestic terrorists just for speaking up, which is what we're talking about today. But Florida had to come back and say, well, then we'll just cut ties with y'all. See ya. Bye. <laughs> See ya. Bye. <laughs> That'll be your takeaway today. Supreme Court ruling on Texas abortion ban is a narrow victory for abortion rights. And that is, as you well know, before the Supreme Court even now, the whole Roe v. Wade thing. New York uh, mask mandates. A new mask mandate in New York. Uh, indoor mask mandate starts tomorrow in New York. Florida, still reporting lowest coronavirus cases per capita. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Florida... With Governor, they call him Governor DeSantis. <laughs> He's a good governor. Now get this, COVID-19 outbreak reported on U.S. cruise ship despite fully vaccinated passengers. Our Norwegian cruise ship last week. Here's a few more. You guys like to see all these? Just kind of brings us up to speed. Because if you're watching just mainstream media, if you're just tuning into the, the big three, the big four, you're not seeing any of this. So we're trying to help, you know. Broaden your horizons. A giant Florida hospital system has ended its vaccine mandate. They will no longer require its 83,000 employees to be vaccinated against COVID. Nevada, 
meanwhile, becomes the first state to impose a surcharge on unvaccinated workers. I mean, talk about opposites. Nevada and Florida, absolute opposites in that regard. Countries allowing the same privileges to the vaccinated and to those who've recovered from COVID-19, natural immunity, and vaccinated, who gets the same privileges? Most of Europe, if you look at that map, most of Europe, they're, they're following science. The FDA says it now needs 75 years to fully release Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine data. But you're mandated to get the vaccine, but we'll tell you in 75 years if it is all good. <laughs> Help us come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Let's stay together on the count of three. One, two, three. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Con oh, get this. Controversial suicide pod that kills peacefully gets the go-ahead in Switzerland. Switzerland might be the first country to approve the use of a suicide pod which promotes painless death in one minute. I mean, that's a headline. Now, it's interesting. I'm throwing out a couple of scriptures on these uh, last few slides because it's just interesting what scripture says. doesn't mean that we're exactly there where the scripture says, but we're heading there, and you can see that we're heading that way. Revelation 9, 6, in those days, speaking of the tribulation... In those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. That's coming. But just the fact that there's a thing called a suicide pod in another country and it's approved. The United Nations, Matt uh, McCarty sent me this this week. It's amazing. The United Nations has this now standing out in front, a guardian for international peace and security sits on the visitor's plaza outside the UN headquarters. The Guardian is a fusion of Jaguar and Eagle and was donated by the government of Mexico. It is created by artists Jacobo and Maria Angelis, and there's the picture. So it's hard to see the size of it, but you can get basically the idea. It's out in front of the UN. People have wondered, what was the inspiration in Revelation 13 as it talks about the Antichrist and some of the evil leadership and... Uh, authoritative nations that will rise and so on. Here's what it says in Revelations 13, 1. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns on its horns, and written on each head were names that blasphemed God. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. Interestingly, this is in front of the United Nations, and the scripture in Revelation 13 is talking about ten horns, which is a picture of ten nations. So, you know, the Bible's coming to pass right in front of us. How long till all of things, all of the things that have been prophesied come to full fruition? Only God knows. But he gives us clues. He gives us signs and signals. Here's another one for you. Some of you maybe have heard of this. This is W O 20 20 06 06 06 a cryptocurrency system using body activity data, a patent. It's really, it's really small print, but I wanted you to just to see the, the picture. This is a patent that was submitted by Microsoft in 2018. It was approved March of 2020, right as the pandemic began. This was approved. What is it? It's the, the, the name of it's interesting to me. The W02020060606 patent. And it is a system, you can see a little diagram of a cryptocurrency server, and then it's connected to this server, and then it's connected to a bodily activity tracker that a human would have, you know, at least initially have on them a watch or, a, you know, some kind of a tracker. And um, for the whole purpose of if you comply with XYZ, you'll get cryptocurrency. And if you don't, you won't. So you can look it up yourself. It's a legit patent. It was approved in 2020 of March. Now, what's interesting is Revelations 13, verses 16 through 18. Again, this is coming someday. Is this patent from 2020 with the crazy numbers 06, 06, 06? Is that this? I don't know. Time will tell. But here's what Revelation says. He requires, speaking of the Antichrist, 
He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead, and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is 666. Well, I mean, is that just coincidence? Or are we watching unfold before us things the Bible said were going to happen for some generation? Then last one here is in Sweden. Facing COVID passport mandates, more Swedes get microchip implants. The rise comes after Sweden required vaccination passports at all events with over 100 people. And so far, 6,000 people have gotten this implant between your thumb and your forefinger. And you can see the picture of this guy putting it in front of his door to open up his door like a fob. Swedes get microchip implants after COVID passports. Latest updates. So it seems a little sci-fi in a way. These are things, I remember reading about these things and talking, you know, with my sisters and others that were all new in the faith, you know, as we read the late great planet Earth and some of these end times books. I remember back in the late 70s, early 80s, talking about these kinds of things. Like, wow, it'll be crazy because like someday, some generation, this is going to happen. And then when we see headlines, you're like, holy smokes. But I'm so glad Jesus said, in him we can have peace. Take heart. I've overcome the world. And all the people said, and here's why. The dystopian world is likely coming in the tribulation. There's no doubt. But here's a great little meme for us. God doesn't have a plan. God is the plan. And all the people said, amen. Well, let me do a quick uh, hopscotch review because in case you haven't been with us all these weeks, I want, I want what, what we're talking about to make sense and have context. So I'm going to hopscotch through things we've covered, but I want you to to see it. All right. So what are we going through? Here's the bullets. Understanding the current condition of our troubled world. There are narratives on every side, but we are in a culture war, a global cultural revolution and reset, a color revolution, cultural Marxism and or devolution. There's a battle for freedom, free speech, freedom of religion. There are narratives of critical theory, false empathy, vilify others, mandates, propaganda, inflation, supply chain trouble, Overreaching government, big tech, media, pharma, academia, confusion in politics, finance, morality, sexuality, gender, lawless behavior, challenges to constitutional rights, gaslighting everywhere. And then there are others who say everything is fine, nothing to see here. So the, the good news for us as believers is none of this is new. It's been happening since the beginning. It's been happening throughout history. We just happen to be living at such a time as certain things are coming together. Gaslighting. Let's talk about that for just a minute to remind ourselves so that you know you're not crazy. All right? We are being gaslit on every side. Does one plus one equal two or not? Gaslighting is used to make you question your memory, your views, your perception, your reality, your judgment to question what you know is true and what you've always known is true and known as science and common sense. You are ghastly if what was obvious yesterday is not obvious and you question it. If you're like, wait a minute, one plus one is always equal two in whatever topic you want to talk about. And then you're challenged that somehow you're the bad guy because you don't think one plus one equals two anymore. That's being gaslit. Gaslighters want to make themselves feel better than. They are woke. You are not. Gaslighting is the worst kind of manipulative uh, behavior. Someone manipulates you into getting what they want. They twist the truth so that you provide them with their needs. So we're certainly in that season. You probably had it maybe at a family gathering or talking to friends or watching the news. You, you've experienced it and you've felt inside, like, what is happening? I mean, how many times have you had dinner or coffee or conversation with somebody, and part of the discussion is, like, what the heck's happening? It's a crazy world out there. I mean, these are common feelings and conversations people are having, and the goal is to make you question what you know is true. The good thing about truth is it doesn't change. 
Truth is truth. The best news is Jesus said he was the truth. So, so we have an anchor. We have a foundation. And you just have to center yourself and be confident and secure in what you know God's word tells you. Uh, in terms of what are we going through, some comparisons to the Bible, understanding the last days and the biblical signs of the times. So again, when is it all going to happen? I don't know. But it sure is ramping up. So here's what we know. There's a setup for the rapture of the church, the tribulation, and the second coming, no doubt. Nations are in position. Players for the Ezekiel 38 war are in motion. There are signs that have been happening for many, many years. In 1948, Israel became a nation. The Six-Day War was won. Jerusalem was recaptured in 1967. There are wars and rumors of wars all the time. Jesus said there would be. Fish in the Dead Sea have suddenly appeared. Predatory birds have also appeared in Israel. Pestilences, famines, earthquakes, and on and on are increasing in the times in which you and I live. The Bible said they would. Signals, the blood moons, asteroids, the Bethlehem star, biblical predictions and prophecies. What did the Bible even tell us about the last days? We looked at this about three weeks ago, but here's the summary. It said, in the last days, people will be lovers of self, selfies, lovers of money, boastful, proud, hate what is good, unloving, unforgiving, reckless, scoffers, itching ears, reject the truth, ungrateful, hypocrites, liars, cruel, and live by doctrines of demons. Religion is told us, the Bible tells us, that even on the religious front, people will act religious but lack true godly power. Well, these are the times we're living in. The Bible gives us confirmation. So then the battle, the battle we face Right now, I mean, some of you are dealing with it, even with jobs, even with mandates, even with kids in school, as we've talked about, even in the whole financial world, secularism versus a biblical worldview. Of course, again, this isn't new. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. This has been the story. It's just heightened these days. Secularism is a worldview that allows no room for the supernatural, no miracles, no divine revelation from God secular, humanistic. A biblical worldview is based on the infallible word of God. When you believe the Bible is entirely true, then you allow it to be the foundation of everything you say and do. Now, you guys know, those of you that have been a part of BFC for a long time, you know that's our heartbeat. One of our core values is a t-shirt some of you wear, the Bible is our plumb line. And it used to be in America, that was like, yay, the Bible is your plumb line. We're a Christian nation. Of course it is. But as you know, in the culture in which we lived in really kind of a post-Christian America, that is not the norm. There's still a bunch of us, no doubt about it, but there's a secularism, a secular mindset that's trying to have more and more people embrace that worldview. There's no God. There's nothing supernatural, no miracles, no life after death. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Well, it's a battle we're facing to help people see what the Bible says. We are in a battle for control. In a democratic government, all the citizens have an equal say in matters concerning their lives. Democracy, by definition, is the rule of the people. We, the people, is what a democracy is all about. And that's all we've known. All of us in this room, it's all we've known our whole life is that we are in a democracy. However... In a totalitarian, authoritarian state, the government's range of control over the people is virtually unlimited. The government controls nearly all aspects of the economy, politics, culture, and society, education, religion, the arts and sciences, even morality and reproductive rights are controlled by the totalitarian governments. Now, those governments are endeavoring to encroach more and more in the American way of life, but again, it's not new because even way back, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he was a totalitarian ruler. Herod, when Jesus was born. Nero, when Paul was preaching the gospel. Hitler, during World War II. I mean, history shows us these kinds of governments, even currently, nations that are totalitarian or authoritarian or dictatorships. Like, it's not new, but it's new for America. And there's a battle happening. 
for control in our country. And I think it's easy for us as Christians to sometimes be a little bit of a la-di-da, just go on our merry la-di-da way. And in a way, that's good. We have that option because as believers, we do live in a different kingdom. We live in God's kingdom. But at the same time, our feet are on earth. And so we have certain responsibilities as well in our earth life, so to speak, while at the very same time embracing everything Jesus told us about our relationship with him and about what we could believe he would do in our lives. And that dichotomy is an interesting one for all of us. I think we navigate it. You know, we, we've used those phrases before. Sometimes people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. So they're out in la-la land, spiritually. In, in a good way, they love the Lord, but they're just not doing any earthly good. On the other side of that, sometimes people are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. So where's the balance? How do we embrace what God wants us to embrace? And I say that collectively, but also individually, because he knows you, your season. He knows your family, your job, your finances. He knows everything about you, about your future. So how do we embrace God's wisdom and God's word so that we both are heavenly minded, but still earthly good, and we're both earthly minded, but still heavenly good? Well, it's a bit of a dance, I think. It's a bit of a Holy Spirit dance to say, okay, Lord, help me. Help me to know what I need to know, that's why we're doing this series, really just to sort of wake us up a bit, just to enlighten us a bit, to go, okay, wow, there, there's a lot happening that I need to know about. And then Holy Spirit, help me, how do I navigate in light of these things in such a way that I stay, listen to this, I stay on the victory side. Because we already have the victory through Jesus Christ. So you don't get into the defeated mindset and depressed and, you know, you don't go into the dystopian world in your mind because you don't need to. We stay on the victory side. We have victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. He said, take heart. Amen. So how do we do it? Well, we've endeavored in this time together just to give us some practical things. Wake up. Look up. Listen up. Stand up. Speak up. You know, there's lots of ups you, we could talk about. So let's wrap up this series then by reminding ourselves about standing up. What can you do in light of this? What should you do? Well, you got to stand up. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul said, be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything with love. Sometimes, you know, you hear certain Christians and certain people talking, and, yeah, they're standing strong, but it's not done in love. I, I'm tempted to say something, but I think I'll irritate too many of you. <laughs> A little teaser there. Okay, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it because I think it's important. We're to do everything in love. You can stand strong, have strong values, have strong beliefs, and lean into them, especially if they're biblical, obviously. But, you know, there's a big chant out there these days. It has to do with Brandon. I don't think that's good for believers. I don't think as believers we should not be, we should not be embracing that. That's not doing everything with love. Now, we may disagree. We may not like. We may go, what the heck? But to be chanting that kind of stuff and then where that came from, you know, what it actually is trying to say, for believers to be promoting that, how does that represent Christ? How does that represent, I'm doing things in love? And all the people said, amen. amen. Now I got the other half mad at me. All right, great. <laughs> for a minute there, I had you on my side. <laughs> I'm not trying to get sides. I'm just trying to give you guys what I think God wants you to, want you to have. All right. What are we going to do? We're going to stand up, be strong, be courageous. Now, Annie mentioned it today. Young people, listen up. You young people, come on. This is your time. You are graced for this season. Some of us in our generation, we're kind of like, what the heck's happening? You young people, millennials, Gen Z, Gen X, you guys, listen, you are graced for it. You are called to the kingdom for such a time as this. The Bible says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on your sons and daughters. 
And so you guys are grace for this. You need to step up. Gen Z, how old are you, Gen Z? You need to step up. It's time for Gen Z, put on their big girl, their big boy pants, step on up. Millennials, Gen Xers. Now, here's such a great, listen to this, you guys. This is history in America. On July 4th, 1776, these were the ages of some of the founders of our country. Betsy Ross was 24. Alexander Hamilton, 21. Nathan Hale, 21. James Madison, 25. Thomas Jefferson, 33. John Hancock, 39. James Monroe, 18. John Marshall, 20. John Adams, 40. Paul Revere, 41. George Washington, 44. So if you are 45 and up, you're off the hook. <laughs> but if you are 44 and below, it's your time, people. It is your time to rise up. Amen. Stand up. Take your place. Here's a great quote from Prager U. It says, let other people blame their parents, their boss, or the system. Let weaker people complain that the world isn't fair, but you are the leader of your life. Take ownership of everything in it. Man, if the church would do that, if Christians would do that, stand up. Take ownership. All right, four ways to stand up. We talked about it last week, so I'll just read these. Center yourself, number one, on a strong foundation. Live out your faith in Jesus and his word in such a way as to provide inspiration for others to follow. Be a real Christian. Number two, be involved in parallel structures. A parallel structure is any kind of business, organization, technology, movement, or creative pursuit that fits within a secular society, whether it's totalitarian, authoritarian, humanistic, while being morally outside of it. Your local church is a parallel structure. Plug into God's church. If there's ever a time to be plugged in to the church of the living God, it is now. Number three, take action. Action must be taken by as many people as possible. Know and exercise your rights as a citizen. Understand the Bill of Rights. Be proactive, run for office, make movies, become a newscaster, teach others, write a book. I mean, you can go down the list. Do something that takes action to influence your sphere and the next generation. Number four, spread the truth and use humor. The success of lies, propaganda, and untruth relies on censoring. Spread the counter-narrative to the propaganda as far and wide as possible. Find new vehicles for receiving news, social media, and for sharing communication. The truth is always more powerful than the lies. So on that one, we'll, we'll take kind of that last point and then wrap up with this whole idea of speak up. But before we do that, I want to give you a list because, you know, Again, you're going to have to get some new sources for news and for social media. It doesn't mean you can't still address and utilize some of the ones you utilize, but you just got to get the counter narrative. You got to get the counterpoint. So here's a list in case you don't know where to go. Here's a list, and I'm sure many of you have lots of other things. These are only the ones I just knew of off the top of my head. Gab, Newsmax, LifeSite, Breitbart, Rumble, Telegram, the Victory Channel, MeWe, one American News, Epic Times, and then Cheryl Atkinson. Do any of you guys remember her? She was a reporter for CNN for many, many years. But she began to do a bunch of research on a variety of things and got censored, kicked off, you know, all the, all the sites. So she's got an incredible article, actually, at her website called Censored. And it's all about who's been censored and how to find them. So I would encourage you to find out, why, first of all, why are they censoring? What are they afraid of? Find out who's been censored and why and who you may need to get some counterpoints from. So you can go to her website and check that out. The other thing at the bottom, I just want you to see this. Because normally when you go to a place of business, even the church, at the bottom of a website, normally it says, you know, connect with us here. And then it puts the Facebook uh, logo and the Instagram logo and the Twitter. You know, it has all the different ways to connect. And that's just normal. But I just happened to see this. LifeSite is a Catholic uh, website. They put out good information, but it's Catholic, very pro-life, and so on, as you would expect. 
at the bottom of their site where they have all the contact, this is the icons they have. And I did laugh. I said, isn't that funny? They've been censored. They've been kicked off everything. So they don't have YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. They have subscribe. They have Telegram, Gab, Rumble, and MeWe. So it's just interesting, meaning there are parallel sources, societies, if you want to call it that. There are parallel economies being developed for people to communicate and to get news and to get a counterpoint. So there, there you go. All right, wrap up. Speak up is our last thing, speak up. How do we speak up? What, in what ways should we speak up? Well, I like this meme. It says, it's scary when the weatherman is the closest one to telling the truth on the news now. <laughs> See, we use humor every now and then just to, you put your stones back in your pocket, okay. Um, we are in a revolution level battle and here's what the author of We Will Not Be Silent, great book, here's what he said, what he wrote. He said, how do revolutions begin? Revolutions begin with a cultural moment, a pretext that will hide the real agenda to justify the revolution. You need, number one, the triumph of an ideology over science, reason, and civil liberties. Then you, number two, recruit people who are willing to advance the revolution of anarchy in the name of justice and equality. And finally, number three, you must silence all dissident voices. Submission to the ide ideology is enforced either by shaming, by laws, or by simple exclusion, such as firing opposing voices from the workplace. So opposing dissident voices is a strategy. That's why all the censoring. So that means voices of a biblical nature have to arise. Here's what Adolf Hitler said. Sad, but awakening. The Protestants haven't the faintest conception of a church. You can do anything you like with them. They will submit. These pastors are used to cares and worries. They learned them from their squires. They are insignificant little people, submissive as dogs, and they sweat with embarrassment when you talk to them. That's sad. Disgusting. But nonetheless, a mindset and an attitude of a view towards believers, towards Christians. George Washington said, if freedom of speech is taken away, then dumb and silent may we be led like sh sheep to the slaughter. So freedom of speech is a right we have, as you guys know. Francis Schaeffer, theologian and pastor, said, if we as Christians do not speak out as authoritarian, totalitarian governments grow from within or come from outside, eventually we or our children will be the enemy of society and the state. No truly authoritarian government can tolerate those who have real absolutes by which to judge its arbitrary absolutes and who speak out and act upon that absolute. In other words, our absolute's the Bible, God's word. So it's easy to know right from wrong. It's easy to make decisions because we have an absolute. We're not relativistic. That is a threat if our absolutes don't match their absolutes and we need to speak out. You have a right to speak out. The First Amendment, the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. We have a right to speak. We have freedom of speech. We have a right to assemble, a right to religion, freedom of religion. A friend of mine is a pastor. He's preaching a great series on courage or cowardice. He pastors a church in Pennsylvania. Pastor Sam, he, he uh, posted this, and he said it's an unpopular truth, but much of the church and Christendom has let the fear of man, public opinion, or the mob, silence them from speaking the truth and have excused it by saying we're just trying to love people. We must remember the Bible doesn't say that love sets free. It says the truth sets free. Telling the truth in love is our responsibility. 
Amen. So, yep. You guys, everybody doing okay? I'm almost done, but I want to get this to you. Esther, Queen Esther, what do we do? How do we speak up? Speak up like Esther. Esther 4 is a story of Queen Esther, and she was having a conversation with Mordecai, her uncle. She was Jewish. There was an edict that had gone out that all the Jews were to be killed. Mordecai was outside of the king's palace, but Esther had been brought in to be one of the wives of the king. He didn't know she was Jewish. Mordecai has a conversation, sent a message to Esther, and here was the message. He said, Mordecai told them to answer Esther to say this, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And so she did. And so they did. And a time came, she went and approached the king. And the king had to extend the scepter. And if he extended the scepter, that meant you have favor, come in. So she approached the king, and he saw her and said, what is it you need, Esther? And he extended the scepter. And she came in, and she shared with him what was happening with the Jews. And the long story short is all the Jews were spared. The king was angry about the plan that one of his people, Haman, had put together and had built gallows to hang a variety of people, including Mordecai. And the king was furious, and he answered Esther with her wishes, and all the Jews were saved in the very gallows that Haman made for others were the gallows he was hung upon. God always to turn the tables. What they meant for evil, God will turn for good. But what happened? Esther spoke up. Somebody had to speak up. So I'm not saying you have to go in front of the king or the governor or the president or the mayor. I'm just saying you have to go in front of somebody. You have to go in your sphere of influence. And speak up with truth and love in Jesus' name. And all the people said, finally, speak up like the Apostle Paul. Romans 10. And this is our mission. This is what we do as believers. Romans 10. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? They can't. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? They can't. And how shall they hear without a preacher? They can't. We have to understand, we can live our lives as Christians, let our light shine, and we should. But at some point, people have to hear the gospel. There has to be a preacher. And likely it's you. You can bring them to church, you should. You can send them a sermon link, and you should. You can give them a book, and you should. Give them a Bible for Christmas, absolutely you should. But you should also sit down with people and say, I love you, I care about you. The most important thing of speaking up and of everything happening in our world, the most important thing is that we would know for sure when you passed away, when I passed away, where would we go for eternity? Now, you might not like me right now. This might be an uncomfortable conversation, but I love you so much, we have to have it. I had that conversation with every member of my family. I was the first one saved in my family, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, Lord, I have to tell my family. They don't know this. And they might think I'm a Jesus freak. Oh, well, I guess they're going to think that. I sat down with every one of them in different scenarios and shared to the best of my ability the gospel with them. Took my dad through the Four Spiritual Laws book. He and his wife, Nancy, read the book, How to Get Saved. Every one of them within two years came to Christ. And these days, we've got cousins and sisters and aunts and uncles and nephews and nieces all love Jesus. Probably, what, 10 or 12 people in our family are now in full-time ministry. How did that happen? All because of God, for sure. 
all by God's power. But the point is, you've got to speak up. The point is, in your family, in your sphere of influence, on the job, wherever you have influence, you, you have to speak up. How shall they hear unless there's a preacher? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How can they call? They can't unless they can believe. How can they believe? They can't unless they hear. How can they hear? They can't unless there's a preacher. you got to speak up. I don't mean you have to become a flame-throwing, on-the-corner, the-end-is-near preacher. I just mean you have to have a conversation. And you got to tell people in love the truth of the gospel. And then the truth of all the other stuff in current events as you feel led. But it's the gospel that's the thing. And all the people said, amen, amen, amen. The summary is we got to stand up, we got to speak up. And then we keep our hopes up according to Psalm 27, just how we started the series. I would have lost heart, but instead I take heart. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for stirring us up, enlightening us, helping us, challenging us today. Father, I pray you take all that we've shared in the series, today's message and all the other ones, God, just plant them in our hearts, let them be watered and grow up and help us, Lord, help all of us to discern how to be heavenly good and earthly good, honoring you, glorifying you, standing up and speaking up for what is right. I thank you, Lord, that eternal fruit will be the result of our time together in Jesus' mighty name, and everybody that agreed said, amen.